Well, welcome to all of this uh, webinar on emotional poverty. I'm so delighted to have you with me today. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of the book and then some more specifics about kinds of things that are in the book. The book is actually a six hour workshop and we won't have time for that, but it will give you a taste of what's in it. So what I am going to do is talk about why we're doing it and what it covers and what it looks like. First of all, it has nine chapters in it. And the first chapter is what uh, causes what it is. And that's what we're going to look at first. Um, it, it occurs in all demographics. And one of the things we know is that it is very prevalent among your affluent students. In fact, I just read a book and one of the things in that book is that she is a psychologist who works with affluent children and what she says is that she thinks they have more emotional issues and are more emotionally distressed than children any other group of children I don't know that she studied children from poverty what we do know is this is that the way I'm defining it in the book is it's not a clinical disorder you won't find it in the DSM-5. It's four characteristics. It's when the brain is physically unregulated and unintegrated, when attachment and bonding is not secure, when the inner self is dominated by inner hurts, and when the external environment repeatedly gives you the message that you're less than and separate from. So in the book, one of the things that those of you that work with K-12 and particularly those of you that work with secondary teachers, I had somebody say to me the other day, oh, you're just doing a hug a thug workshop. And I was like, no, we're always going to have consequences. But I think now, particularly in the United States for second is that students and teachers are getting shot. And there are ways to know who, which are most likely to come from. There's ways to know how you emotionally triage a building so you can accurately stay safe. And there are ways to indicate that a child is significantly distressed enough that they could be a shooter. So it's this is, book is not about just about reducing anger and violence and anxiety. It's also about how you stay safer as a whole school community. One of the issues is that it's important to remember is we will always have consequences, but if we change the approach, we will have much safer schools, much less anger, and much less anxiety. So the first chapter of the book is called, Why Do Students Explode? And Why Are They Out? And the answer is simply, it is an unregulated and an unintegrated brain. So what is that? And I'd like to go through that with you. It's important, emotion is processed 200 to 5,000 times faster than thought. So immediate, so fast, that often students have exploded even before they fly. And in an unregulated and an unintegrated the brain actually cannot or does not name or control their emotional response. It's fast and it's lightning fast. So I like the model that Siegel uses. It's a simple model to teach it to you and I'm gonna ask you to teach it to your students because it is a mental abstractly reference what's happening in their brain without having all the angst and anger that goes around it. So if you will, Right now, if you have a piece of paper, would you draw your hand out, lay your hand down and draw it out with your palm up, like you see on the screen? If I could give you about 15 seconds to do that, I want to ask you to label this, and, and in a bit, you'll see why. If you don't mind, and by the way, it is all in the book, but if you will, outline your hand with your palm up. That is your, 
we're going to label it. Your wrist now is your spinal cord. This is your brain stem. And your brain stem is an involuntary set of systems. Your brain stem controls sex, awake, asleep, fight, flight, flee. It's all those automatic responses. You know the BG song, staying alive, staying alive, staying alive? That's what your brain stem does. It's the basis of your motivational system, food, shelter, reproduction, and it works with your limbic area to get you to act. Okay. The thumb is the limbic region of the brain. Now, if we were really, it's the amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A. Now, if you take your two hands and go like this, some individuals say that this would be probably close to the actual size of your own individual brain. Now, some bodies are bigger, so their hands are bigger. But the bottom line for you personally is probably close to the size of your brain. And you notice you have two thumbs. If we were being technical about this, you would have one for your right brain and one for your left brain. And what we know is this, is that this is the amygdala. It's your emotional center. It, with your brain stem, emotions. See, one of the things that happens when you're very young, when you're an infant, is that you begin to seek out and check out information that you have mo millions of stimuli coming to you at once. So your brain has to figure out what is really important to pay attention to. And your caretaker often helps you kind of decide that. This is important to pay attention to, this isn't. So in this of the thumb, it is structured through the environment and our relationships. And what do you pay attention to? You know, your, your caretaker, your mother brings your milk to you. Oh, you like the smell of that. What you, you associate a good feeling with that. That is the beginning of emotions. And emotions either move you towards something or away from something. Cortisol is released if this gets activated. It can be traumatized. And it is important this thumb, our emotional states to a large extent are created without any kind of conscious knowing because they're created so young. And because it's structured by the time we're three years old, it gets restructured in adolescence. But many, many things are recorded at a level that we are not aware of. It integrates experiences. And this, the limbic area, the thumb, the amygdala, along with the hippocampus, helps us create this tapestry of emotion. The back of your hand, the fingers over your thumb, are your cortex of your brain. It's, it's what covers your brain, okay? And it is where you move your brain from feeling and reaction to thought and ideas, sensations. And it allows us to think about our thinking. And the two middle fingers of this are the prefrontal cortex. This is right up here, working memory, impulse control. It is where we do planning. It is for reward analysis. Well, what happens when the, your sense of time, your sense of self, it controls impulsivity, has insight and empathy. It's where you get your moral judgments. Well, what happens is when the brain talks to the, uh, when the brain talks to the uh, brain, when the thumb talks to the brain stem, and the brain stem, the hand covers this, it's integrated when it talks to this, it is regulated when it talks to the thumb. So when your emotions are integrated and regulated, your amygdala is talking to your brainstem, and it is regulated by your prefrontal cortex, by your thoughts. When this doesn't happen, the brain explodes, and it's in, in your face. And you have an explosion. So the question becomes this. When you have an explosion, then, you literally have an unregulated, unintegrated brain. 
and it's limbic lava. Now, I'm gonna stop for a minute. And one of the things that's really important to know here is this. If this happens to you, a student does this to you, our first response is literally to go, oh my, how, how disrespectful. But if you're on your mind, you say to yourself, I am so sorry. I am looking at right now an unintegrated, unregulated brain. Then you have reframed it and you are going to say to yourself, okay, if I go back at the student this way, now there are two unintegrated, unregulated brains in the room. And that simply will be a disaster. So I'm going to stop for a minute now and have you go back over your notes. Can you teach that back to you? Because I'm going to ask you to teach it to students. I didn't realize how powerful this was until I was teaching this to a friend of mine who's a college professor and his ninth grade student uh, son was with him and we were talking about something and his son said um you know that's me he said i was explaining to him and we were talking about it and he said that a lot of times i'm like this and his father said yes that's true and his father told me that they had adopted him when he was in the fifth grade and the student often had these explosions I forgot about it. We went on to another conversation. About a half hour later, this young man was talking about something and he said, you know, I was at camp and this man, another camper, threw ice at him in the shower, threw ice over the shower at him. And he said, you know, my hand went like this. And then he said, my thumb came out, but it didn't. And then I went like this and I controlled it. And I thought, oh my goodness, how fast you began to figure out how to represent what happened to you in a way that is representational and you can address it and you can talk about it and you can think about it. One of the elementary schools I worked with in Corpus Christi, what they did was they um, taught this to their elementary kids. So whenever there was an explosion in the classroom, the kids understood that this is what happened. And then they learned, as I'm going to teach you in a bit, what you have to do to regulate it and bring it back. It's a wonderful teaching tool. Now, you should know that if the child comes out of financial poverty, the prefrontal cortex is undeveloped. University of Berkeley, California, did research with 10 girls, and they put them in brain scanners and looked uh, at their prefrontal cortexes. And what they found for children in financial poverty, that their brains looked like adults who had a stroke. They were not developed. It wasn't that they couldn't be, it's just that they were not developed by the environment. So your children from financial poverty have more problems with this brain regulation. Now, for those of you that are pre-K and kindergarten, one of the things that's being reported to me across the United States right now is the number of pre-K and kindergartners that are simply out of control. One of the things we know is that they, uh, in this process, they're out of control and they explode. They have regulated brains at all. What we know is that you have to teach regulation. In fact, more children in pre-K and kindergarten were put in alternative placement last year than any other grade level. I have people telling me stories about kindergartners who rip off all their clothes and run around the room naked. Um, children who have to be before they can nap. Children for whom it takes a therapy dog an hour and a half to calm them down. So one of the things we know is it takes more and more children are coming with brains that are simply not regulated. What does that mean? You and I, we have 
been taught to have an internal voice inside our head that tells us what to do and not to. For example, if you've ever been driving on the interstate and you wanted to help somebody else off the road, well, you probably said something to yourself like, not today, or no, I don't want to go to jail, or no, you regulated your behavior. Well, when that internal there, you have to give it to them. So one of the tools that we have on our website that I'm going to really recommend to you, it's a free download. It's called Teach Teddy. And you Xerox these lessons. And what you do is each child has a stuffed animal or a teddy bear. And what they do is they, each lesson, they teach their teddy bear how to behave at school. And every day that the teddy bear, i.e. them, behaves the way they're supposed to, they, they get a sticker. And what happens is if the child has a day where their behavior is not good, then the teacher will say, I need you to go back and teach Teddy how to behave because he's having difficulty. And so the child will go back and teach him. And what that does then is help him or her regulation of behavior. And this is a PDF you print it off directly from our website. Now, here's the protocol for an emotional meltdown. When you have a student who has an emotional meltdown, the first thing you have to remember in your brain, I'm dealing with an unregulated and unintegrated brain. It's, this is not a disrespect issue particularly. It's about an unregulated and an unintegrated brain. And then you have to say, how will I contain that behavior? What will I do with that behavior? the issue? If so, I'm going to have to get that student out of here. Prior to any emotional meltdown, you want to make sure that the students understand the hand model of the brain. So one of the things you can say to the student is, look, is it brain today? When they calm down and they'll go, yeah. So then let's say, what do we have to do to keep that from happening? Okay. And so you teach them then a series of calming techniques. And I'd like to teach those to you. And there's another technique called validation. So what are calming techniques? Well, several of them. I'm, only, I'm not going to go through the whole list with you. I'm going to give you two or three. But one of my favorites, of course, is water. 10 to 12 ounces of water, particularly for boys, is very beneficial because it does two things. It metabolizes cortisol, okay? And cortisol creates anxiety. What cortisol does is the chemical you produce when you're upset. And it actually changes your physiology. It increases heartbeat. Several kinds of things occur. So water will calm that down. And one of the things you can tell after they drink water, what you can tell when the water is working because their shoulders will start to relax. Another tool I love is looking up. Looking up, when the eyes, how many of you have children that cry all the time? <coughs> Excuse me. If you tell them to look up, see when your eyes are anywhere across the top of your forehead, between 12 and 10 and 12 o'clock, if your face is a clock, what your brain is doing neurologically is accessing what is stored visually. When your eyes are moving between your ears, what your brain is doing is accessing what is stored auditorily. When your eyes are down, you're accessing what is stored uh, emotionally. And when children get upset and start crying, their eyes are down a lot because they're crying. If you tell them to look at the ceiling, okay, and then I usually had them do something like draw a guitar or something like that, the thing is they're not able to, to uh, the emotion. See, one of the things we tell students, a lot of times students get upset because of an academic issue that they're having difficulty with. And one of the things you will find for many of your students who are having academic difficulties is that their eyes never go up. If you watch, their eyes never go up. See, school is about visual discrimination, how letters are different, how numbers are different. And many times your students, their eyes don't go up. So what you do is this, is you tell them to look up and we tell them 
your brain is like a camera. And what your brain does is your brain takes pictures and you can take pictures with your brain and remember it. What we find is so calming. Let me give you an example. When my son was in the first grade, he came home from school. He would come home every night from school crying about his math homework. And I was surprised because he had an almost perfect auditory memory. But this was problem solving. And so he was doing subtraction, one to 10. So one day I was watching his eyes and his eyes were down and he was crying. And I said, Tom, look at the ceiling. If you paint those numbers up there along the ceiling, put them up there, print them up there in dark letters along the ceiling, you'll be able to look up and see them. And then you can put your problem up there and solve it. He said, I don't like my eyes up there. So about a week later, he was doing his math homework and he wasn't crying. And I said, Tom, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, mom, you know that thing you told me to do with my eyes? He said, I print them up on the wall, one through 10. I make them blink. Then I count backward. And when I count backward, they quit blinking. And then I know what the answer is. When he was a senior in high school, he had a Nobo solo. And he called me on the road. I was traveling. And he said, Mom, I have a real problem. He said, my problem is that I know that solo. I have it memorized. But when I get in front of the band, my fingers freeze and I'm terrified. I said, Tom, where's your Nobo? He said, it's on my lap. I said, you know what you need to do? You need to. I said, are you looking down when you reach down to get it? He said, yes. I said, don't do that. I said, look, paste that music on the wall, okay? You got it memorized, so print it up there on the wall. Keep your eyes on that music. And then I said, pick up your elbow, but don't look down when you pick it up, and you're going to be okay. And he was. It's just when he was looking down, he was getting the feelings. It's a very, it's a wonderful way children to stay calm and learn at the same time. Another tool that's on here that I want to talk about is tapping and touch. Now, I want to say a little bit about before we say this. It's called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. All of you know about acupuncture, okay? And acupuncture, in the early 1900s, the American Medical Association made a decision to not use chemicals, but instead, sorry, to not use the energy system of the body, but to focus on chemicals. Everything in your body is either an electrical or chemical trans. And the American Medical Association decided that they were going to use the chemical and surgery, drugs and surgery. The Chinese kept the energy system. And in the energy system or electrical system, they see your body as a set of meridians, a lot like latitude and longitude. And wherever those latitude and longitude meridians intersect is a pressure point, and that's what acupuncture does. Well, you can do yourself, and it's tapping the healer within emotional freedom technique, and it you can use adults can use it to lose weight to stop smoking, to deal with anxiety. I mean, I've done it to myself. But there's a book you can buy for kids called Gorilla Thumps and Bear Hugs on Amazon. And what you do is you read the story to kids. I've used it at elementary, and they, they tap along with the story. And so it's a story about this little boy and girl at recess. Somebody made fun of him, her. She's crying. The little boy says, oh, let me tell you, I know this magic tapping technique. And then where you tap is here. There's pressure points here. They're under your nose. They're, they're under your eyes, under your nose, under your chin, right here on your collarbone where it's soft, okay? Under your arms under your breasts, and then you tap your thumb, this finger, this finger, and this finger, and then you do a karate chop, the edge of your hand. And I would recommend, I would be careful how I approach tapping in school, but I know a secondary teacher who just does this. She tells her students, okay, before we take the test, you're going to give three karate chops, okay? And so one of the things that happens, a lot of chemical, nerve, not chemical, nerve endings here, 
So it's a wonderful way to do that. But you can use this, Gorilla Thumps and Bear Hugs. And then there's even a book called The Tapping Solution for Teenage Girls. But it is a very calming technique. Now, here's the point. It doesn't hurt. You can't do any damage with it. It doesn't hurt anyone. So it's a wonderful way, again, for calming. One thing that I'm going to recommend at the secondary level to really help regulate behavior and calm kids down is this future story with a visual storyboard. And what you do in this case is this. You have students take an eight sheet of paper, they go to the internet, and they put one picture on there for each of these things, what their high school diploma looks like, military school, what kind of work do they want to do, the car and the vehicle, the pay, what kind of money do they want, what kind of a house do they want to live in, friends, relationships and marriage, what do they want to do for fun, and then they can make a plan. They go backward. 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, etc. And what do I have to do each year to make that happen? One of the things that I've done with this is when a student engages in a behavior that is simply not productive at all, I say to them, okay, this behavior you just used is not going to help you get your future story. Is that what you want? If you want this future story, then what you just did is going to keep you from doing that. And they will go, oh, oh, and I'll just say, is that what you wanted? I'm going to apologize for the noise right now. I am uh, at an airport during this webinar between flights and I'm just sorry about the noise um, so please bear with me and what you do then is you ask them to figure out their future story I've also used it another way when they don't want to do an assignment I'll say to them hey if you don't do this assignment, it's going to be very difficult for you to get this future story that you wanted. And I thought you wanted this. They'll say to you, it's too hard for me. I'm just not going to do it. And I'm going to say, but I thought you wanted this. And a lot of times they'll go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I do. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. So you're putting it together for them. But what you're teaching them is the regulation of behavior. You're building this piece right there for them. They're calming techniques. So there are more calming techniques in the book, but these are some beginning understandings. The second chapter in the book is about what motivates bad behavior. Why do children behave badly? I was very interested in this. And I went back to the clinical research and it's there. It just hasn't translated out to educators. And I look back to see what had to happen. And it has to do with the self-construction of this thumb, okay? What happens is that when you construct, this thumb really becomes the core self, the inner self of who you are. And it's a set of beliefs and feelings that form a perspective that you act on. It becomes what you act on. And I read a man named Stasny and his research is fascinating because he researched why men beat women. And one of the things he was very interested in is why that happens, why the inner self is so important. Why is it? Because it's the motivation for good behavior. And in the book, I look at the clinical research about what has to happen from birth to one, from ages one to three, years two and three, four and five, six through puberty, puberty through 18, that has to do with the development of this inner self. And what you do in that time frame is you develop continuums, like birth to one, it is about trust, distrust. Where am I on that emotional continuum? Do I trust my environment? Do I trust my caregiver? Do I distrust it? And one of the things we know is that understanding, that emotional understanding tends to go with you all your life. 
It's partly genetic, it's partly environmental. And what we, years two and three, that's where you do autonomy versus shame, okay? Can I do this by myself or am I gonna have too much failure? Are people gonna make fun of me? And all your life, if you learn that so young, you're hesitant, for example, if you moved over toward the shame side, you're gonna be hesitant to try new things because, ooh, and what in the four and five, it's about initiative versus guilt. Let me do it, let me do it, let me try it. And a huge, huge issue around fairness, whether things are fair or not. And so these emotional continuums get imprinted very young and it becomes the motivation. Now, they get redone in adolescence and you can change them all your life, but they're deeply imprinted then. And if I see myself as more distrustful than trusting, if I see myself as more shamed, then I can do things by myself, more guilty than initiative, those continuums, industry versus I can't try, okay? Then I'm gonna think of myself at a deep level as needy, a victim, harmful, hurting and damaged. But if I see myself as a strong person, yes, I trust people. Yes, I'm capable. I can do that. I can take initiative and make it work. I can do this. Then I see myself very compassionately and very positively at an inner, inner self. If I'm weak, if this development of this thumb is weak, then I'm going to think I'm less than and separate from, ignored, unlovable, not cared about. If I am strong, then I'm gonna believe I belong. I'm equal to, I'm a part of, I'm nurturing, I'm lovable. And the research is this, I'm going to engage in the behavior that reinforces my inner self. So here's what motivates bad behavior. If I see myself as less than and separate from, then it gets tapped. If my brain is unregulated and unintegrated, then I'm gonna be angry. And angry is fascinating for this reason. Angry, anger produces two chemicals at once. It's both an analgesiac and it's an amphetamine. It gives you energy, amphetamine, and it numbs your students who are actually addicted to anger because it is so soothing for their hurt inner self. And what I do then, when I get angry, that gives me the energy to attack you. And it also soothes my own pain. So I'm going to attack you so that the damage goes to you so that I have less pain. I will do anything to you or for me to get away from the pain. And it is just an explosion because this is not integrated, this is not regulated. And so it motivates bad behavior. So for that reason, in the hard research, the more punitive and negative the discipline, the more bad behavior you get because it just reinforces that the inner self is bad. Now there's a technique I'm gonna teach you called validation that will help you move a weak inner self to a strong inner self. Chapter three, so I'm skating over this pretty fast with you. I'm leaving a lot out. Chapter three is why do discipline strategies work with some kids and not with others? And it has to do with this further development of this thumb. It's called bonding and attachment and very heavily researched by two researchers named Bowlby and Ainsworth. And what Bowlby theorized, Bowlby was fascinating because he said this, when a baby is born, it basically cannot tell one person from another. Yet by their first birthday, they know who they like and who they don't like. They can tell who's familiar and who's a stranger. When the person they love leaves, it creates anxiety and loss. When they come back, they're joyful, happy to see them. Without, on this foundation, it seems that the emotional life is built. And without this foundation, there is risk for future health and happiness. And he studied with a woman named Marsha Ainsworth. Now there is a genetic component to this. 
And one of the things we know is there are five personality characteristics that are universal around the world. They're continuums. One is a continuum of extrovert versus introvert. One is a continuum of open versus closed. They're continuums. But there's also a genetic component. For example, anxiety. Another one is autism. But what Marsha Ainsworth and John Bowlby discovered is there were four basic styles of bonding and attachment. And I want to explain these to you because it's why discipline works for some children and not for others at all. And one of the things that becomes very important as we talk about this is your ability, you recognize these students as I talk about them. And two of these bonding and attachment styles are where the majority of the shooters come from. So what are they? Well, first, let me tell you about the research. John Bowlby theorized that if you were emotionally well, he said that someone who's emotionally well has bonding. In other words, they're bonded, they belong, and they're safe. And that if you feel like you're loved and you feel safe in your environment and with people you love, then you will free, be free to explore. So what Marsha Ainsworth did is she took one-year-olds and she put them in a room with toys and she had their caregivers come in and drop them off and leave them there. And periodically the caregivers would work, walk through the room, but she also had strangers walk through the room. And then what they did through two-way mirror is observed how the children responded both to the caregiver and the stranger. Well, the first style of these four styles, secure and attached, the first one was secure and attached. These children, they cried a little bit when the caregiver left, but then they went and played with the toys, were happy. If they saw a stranger, they knew they were a stranger, but they, they weren't fearful of the stranger. And when the parent came back, they'd greet them, kiss them, run to them, and then they'd go back and play again. And what Bowlby and Ainsworth said was, the child's sense of self is integrated, this thumb is integrated and regulated, and they believe their inner self is strong. They believe they belong and they're safe. They're not easily influenced by their peers. They tend to do better academically. They form healthy relationships. Their brain tends to be regulated and integrated, and they respond to your traditional discipline techniques. They're the ones you want a whole class full for. And Stasny said, their philosophy is, I'm lovable, and you will find my love worth having. The next group were children who were avoidant. One of the things that was so interesting about them is that when the caregiver dropped them off, they didn't cry. They turned around in the room. They didn't particularly bond or get attached to anybody in the room. They, strangers came in. They didn't bother them. When the caregiver came back, they didn't greet them. They weren't glad or sad to see them. And what Siegel said in his book is that for whatever reason, the bonding circuitry attachment in the brain, the circuitry attachment just does not get activated. They just don't bond to people. Now, sometimes it's because of the caregiver. The caregiver didn't bond to the child. Sometimes it's because the child might be autistic and doesn't bond. But for whatever reason, they didn't bond. And what he said was, and a lot of times, Bowlby and Ainsworth attributed it to the caregiver, that the caregiver just wasn't there for the child. They perfunctory, they took care of the child, but there was no emotional attachment or bonding. The child's sense of self is disconnected from people. They tend to be loners. They have difficulty with forming relationships. They're restricted emotionally. They avoid assignments that require a group activity or an emotional response. Peers do not like them. They do not respond to typical discipline strategies at all. And their philosophy is, I'm unlovable. You're going to reject me, so why bother? And this is one of the groups that shooters come from. A lot of shooters are males who are loners. They're just loners and they're not attached. And one of the interesting things is these students drive teachers crazy because it doesn't matter what you do, they don't care. You can't have recess, I don't care. 
You can't have time on the computer. I don't care. You won't get this treat. I don't care. There's no, the motive of relationships and emotional responses simply aren't there. We're anxious. These, when the caregivers came to see them or dropped them off, the children hung, hung, clung to the, the parent, didn't want to leave. They cried. They looked around the room. A stranger walked in. They were anxious. They watched for the caregiver to return. When the caregiver returned, they clung to them. They, they cried. They're anxious. These are your children who are at your desk all the time and saying things to you like, did I do this right? Is this right? Did I do this right? I'm not sure I can do it. They're insecure and anxious. They're very anxious. They're often easily bullied. They have difficulty with boundaries in relationships. They do not always do the work because it might not be right. They need repeated assurances. And if there's a relationship problem, they're sure they're the fault. And their philosophy is, I'm not lovable, but you are so loving that I will do anything to get you to stay or like me. The last group is safe and dangerous, or disorganized and dismissive, but they are both safe and dangerous. In the research, Stosny says that this is 10% of the general population, but 80% of children who come from drug addicted households. And this thumb on this child is fragmented. One of the things that happens in abuse is that in order to survive the abuse, the individual often focuses on a detail that's insignificant just in order to survive. But a lot of things happen that gets recorded at the subconscious level, but not the conscious level. So they don't know it's there. So they react and don't always know why. And the child's sense of self is fragmented, unregulated and unintegrated. They operate out of fear and anger. They cannot name their emotions. They have parents who are often safe and dangerous and they tend to rage when angry. Few boundaries, little attachment. They do not respond to typical discipline techniques at all. They need development of regulation and inner strength. Their philosophy is, I'm lovable, but you're either too insensitive or you're just not worthy of my love. So two shooters in Columbine fell in this group. In fact, they wrote in their diaries, people should be killed. They're no better. They're not as good as animals. They don't deserve to live. They should be killed. Let me tell you a story about safe and dangerous because it's, it's a hard concept for people to get. But the person is both safe and dangerous. A high school principal told me this story, assistant principal. He said, Ruby, because he and I had been talking. He's, they had this 17-year-old boy in his building. And they had suspected that they knew they had a student coming into the faculty lounge. And what the student was doing was putting a paper towel down in the toilet, brown paper towel defecating on it, then covering it with white toilet paper and leaving it there because it's not flushable. Well, the principal told me this boy, from the time he was in elementary school, she would come up to school yelling at them, screaming at them. She was going to litigate them. She'd wave her cell phone. I'm going to do get this for you. You did this to me. Well, they put cameras on the door of the bathroom and pretty much figured out it was this student. So when he called the mother to tell her that his son was her son was suspended, she defended the son, said, no, it couldn't be true. They were picking on him. Well, that weekend, there was a party. A high schoolers had a party. And this 17-year-old boy had paid a high school girl $20 to borrow her car. And he had taken the car, taken a 14 year old freshman girl who was a virgin in the back seat, brutally raped her. She was in the hospital for several days. Well, when the police came up to school the week before, two days before Christmas to arrest the boy 
as an adult for rape, the principal had to call the mother. And the mother said, you know what? That boy and the man in the house. Now, I don't know who that was. That boy and the man in the house got in a fight. I called the cops. The cops said I had to press charges against them both. She said, I refuse to do that. You know what I've just decided? She said, that boy is worthless. He can go to jail. I don't care. I'm not going to have anything to do with him anymore. And the principal said to me, Ruby, what I understood is the boy is safe and dangerous. She, he said, all this time, I thought he was psychotic, crazy, neurotic. He said, he's had a safe and dangerous mother, and he's safe and dangerous. I said, yes, he's safe and dangerous. And what we know is that for these children, they don't respond to discipline at all. I had a kindergarten boy when I was a principal who was safe and dangerous. Um, I don't think I've ever cried for a child as many times as I did, but he was hurting other children. And so we had to contain him uh, and remove him from the building, but it's safe and dangerous. And they need boundaries. They're very manipulative very charming often, but they need boundaries. Uh, you can and can't do this. So you have these four styles. What I'm gonna recommend that you do is there's motivation for good behavior and it's a process of validation. But I wanna talk about a process that I recommend you use in your building, particularly if you're at the secondary, middle or high school. I recommended it in elementary too but it's a process of emotional triage. Now that you know what I've showed you, you can predict where your violence is gonna come from. And what you wanna do is step one, just like we do academic targeting and we look who's going to be most at risk of failing, you wanna do the same thing with emotional pieces. And you wanna gather a team of individuals at your campus to include a principal, an assistant principal, a counselor. Then you're gonna ask, don't let one person do it. Then you're gonna ask each teacher to submit a name, list of names of students who have the most anger, the most violent tendencies, those are who are social isolates, loners, who display difficult behavior. A lot of times in our analysis of children, we leave out the loners because they're often not overt discipline problems, but they're one of the groups that shooters come from. And what you do is you make a chart that looks like this. Who are the insecure and anxious ones? Who are the insecure and avoidant ones? Who are the ones who are safe and dangerous? And you put their list, their names for the whole building. You are triaging the building. And then what you do is you identify for each group, which are the most, most needy, most unstable in terms of their personality and their emotional response and their behavior. And then what you do is you make a plan for each student. And one of the things I recommend in your plan is that you assign a staff member who talks to each one staff member, custodian, uh, secretary, a teacher, whomever. They talk with that kid one-on-one -on -one every day, three to four minutes. And the reason is to assess the child's stability for that day. You're keeping a constant tab on them. The other day, my husband and I went to a new church that his son goes to. And we went early because we were saving seats. Well, while we were there, they had all these church members who were milling around the audience. Three different church members came up and talked to us. Oh, who are you? Why are you here? Oh, oh, really? Yes, we know them. Yes. Oh, where do you live? When we got out of there, I said to my husband, I said, you do know that was the church security team. And he said, what do you mean? I said, look, they're using current church members and they know everybody who's gonna be in that, anybody who comes in that's not their normal member, they know who they are. I said, 
ever since that church shooting in Texas, they are trying to figure out, are you safe or are you dangerous? Do I know you? And should we watch out for you? And the schools are going to have to do the same thing. What is the stability status of that kid every day? I had a high school principal in Georgia tell this story. He's got 3,000 kids. And one of the things he started doing, now he's a big teddy bear kind of guy. But one of the things he started doing was every morning at the end of the PA system, he'd say, and I want you to know I love you. Well, he did that for a week or two and no response. And he thought, you know, I better probably stop doing that because it's these are high school kids. So he stopped it. Within three days, he got 30 emails from kids that said, why did you stop telling us you love us? So he started doing it again. He said one of the things that happened in his school is that he had a situation where a kid, and he said, I'm always in the lunchroom, always in the lunchroom. You learn a lot about kids in the lunchroom. And he had a kid tell him that another student had a gun. And so what he did is he found where the student was and he, he found his, but he found his SRO officers too. And they wanted to go in there, charge, grab the kid, yank him up against the wall. He said, oh no, we're not gonna do it that way. So he went into the cafeteria, he had his phone up like this and he pointed at the kid and he went, your mother, your mother, okay? Come, I need to talk to your mother. So the kid got up quietly out of the seat followed him out of the room, followed him into another room where the SRO officers were waiting, put him up against the wall, hands up, and sure enough, he had a gun under his shirt. He said, but we did it quietly. We did it without a lot of fuss. We did it without noise. We did it in a way that was respectful, but we kept everybody safe. One of the things that has to happen in, is there has to be this way of emotional triage. Who's monitoring the emotional level of these children? And you can read students, you know that. And then a referral system is in place. I, I met a woman who was the CEO of a behavioral health hospital in Florida. And what she told me is they were having so many adolescents come to her who were suicidal, uh, death, addiction, cutting, et cetera. And by the time they got to the hospital, the problem was that they were in emergency room, ICU care, and it was costing the hospital so much that they weren't getting reimbursed for it. So they went to the high school alternative center and they said, look, would you please let us send a therapist over to your building twice a week, we won't charge you, to meet with students who wanna meet with us who and recommend students who you think are most at need because we would like to intervene before it gets to the life death level that we're seeing. So the school said yes, they sent counselors over. Well, the hospital costs dropped the student attendance went up, the student graduation went up, the discipline referrals dropped. It was a referral system that was in place. The boy in Florida who killed all those students, he had been kicked out, but he came back and he had been referred, but no one had followed up on referrals. This is an emotional triage process. And the feds call it a behavioral threat assessment. Who is most likely to cause you harm? This is a very simple way to do it. Teachers know, and administrators know. And if you look at your loners and you're safe and dangerous, you can prevent a lot of things happening. I'm not saying you'll prevent everything, but you can make the place a lot safer. Now, we're 10 minutes to the end of our webinar, so just let me tell you what else is in the book. One of the chapters that administrators like the most is a chapter on emotional noise in the classroom. The emotional classroom dance. So the question is, who walked into your classroom? Well, a lot more people than you know. 
Johnny walked in with his dead father, his angry mother, and his drug addicted sister. And you walked in with your own people. Who did you bring inside your head? Your children, your spouse, you know, who did you bring? And your classroom looks like this. You thought there were 25 people in there. They're not. There's at least 75. And that's one of the reasons you have so much more noise before and after holidays, because they're bringing all these people into the room with them. And you brought yours. So the noise level is huge. And many times when students react in your classroom, it's not you they are reacting to. It's the people they brought in there with them. So how do you begin then to figure out that noise, the noise you brought in, the noise they brought in, how do you begin to stabilize that so that you can have a classroom that actually works? And there are four factors. Here's what influences the noise in the classroom. Who the students brought in their heads with them, who the teacher brought in with their heads, the bonding and attachment style of the student, the bonding and attachment style of the teacher, Emotional triggers, there's a chapter in the book about how you can figure out what your own, a section in the book, how you can figure out what your own emotional triggers are. There's different energy and stress levels that we bring in. The age and stage of development of the child, which is in the book, but then there's a whole section in there on predictable stages that adults go through all their life. Many people do not know that there's a whole bunch of research on adult development stages. Just like kids go through developmental stages, so do adults in their life. And it doesn't mean that you will go through them at that time, but they're stages that adults go through as they age and they impact what happens in the classroom. And it's very beneficial if you know those for yourself personally. Uh, I learned so much about myself. It was so wonderful to know that, okay, I'm in this age frame. Here are probably some of the things I'm going to experience. And one of the things we do in the workshop is we have the group break up into 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, or if you want to be in that age, 50 plus. And they write down the advantages and disadvantages of their age. And they are so in sync with the research. It's fascinating to identify how that impacts the classroom. So in conclusion, let me say this, that in the book, people say this to me, Ruby, look, we can't control what they come in with. We, we, we can't control what happens to them outside of school. Actually, that's true. But there's a whole bunch of things we can do and one of the things that we can do is we can teach students about a regulated, integrated brain and how to calm themselves. We can build inner, strong inner selves through validation. We can construct classrooms in which the noise is less. We can have safer classrooms and campuses by doing emotional triage. We can better identify our emotional issues. We can be aware of our own emotional realities and our participation in the safety and well-being. We will always keep consequences in place, but we can change the approach. And education has been and always will be a social endeavor. It's a human endeavor. And we can, by paying more attention to our students and their emotional well-being, we can create a high-quality education that is safer for everyone. We can do that. The research. Wow. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for dealing with the extra noise level at the airport. And thank you for all you do for students. You can go on our website to get the book if you like. Thank you so much.